comes from the book of John, chapter 19 and verses 25 through 27. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. During the season of Lent, we are teaching a Sunday school class, a short-term temporary Sunday school class uh, in the fellowship hall. And uh, this is open to anyone. Uh, we have a few people from Sunday school classes that uh, come in, and we have a few people that are new that haven't joined a Sunday school class who are part of it. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful mix of people, people that have been here for generations, and then people that are brand new. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a young lady come in, and it was her first uh, time in this class, and it was her second time in this church. And she happened to sit right next to my wife, Julie, because her class was in there that day. And, and as I was teaching, uh, Julie raised her hand. Now, you have to understand, my wife, Julie, is also a seminary graduate and had a little bit better grades than I did. Um, so she raised her hand, and uh, this is one of those moments where you, you're worried about this because I may have said something wrong, and she's about to correct me in front of everyone. Um, but that's not what happened. She raised her hand and she added a point that I had not covered. And I said, you're exactly right, Julie. Thank you for adding that. And I kept going. And I looked over a second later and my wife and the young lady that was here for the second time in our church were just laughing at the table. And I didn't know what happened. I just thought, well, maybe I said something that was funny. Maybe she did, I don't know. After the, uh, the worship service, because we go straight from Sunday school to the worship service. After the worship service, I asked my wife, I said, what were you laughing at? Well, and she said, when I said, you're exactly right, Julie, thank you. Apparently, audibly, even though she meant it to be under her breath, she said, of course I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, the young lady just started laughing because she heard Julie say this. So after the Sunday school class, she told me this is what she did. She came up to the young lady and she said, I just realized you probably don't know. That's my husband. I'm allowed to talk to him like that. <laughs> and that got me thinking about family. Like what, what are we allowed to say or not say about our family, right? We might be able to talk about our families with our family members, but all of a sudden, if somebody else criticizes our family, what happens? We get real defensive, don't we? There's something about family uh, that is both a blessing and sometimes a burden, right? There's the blessing of having people that love you, who know you, who know what you used to be like and are always there to remind you about that, to remind you where you're from, who you're from, but there are also times in which our family can become burdens. Uh, they sometimes descend into petty arguments. They sometimes become difficult to manage. You know, families are wired into human existence, aren't they? Whether it be the families that we're born into or the families that we end up building in this life. From the very beginning, Families were created because it was not good for people to be alone. Adam and Eve, right? It was not good for Adam to be alone. Eve was created, family was created so that we would have other people. But it extends beyond just a marriage or children and parents. It extends pretty far into what it means for us to be family. What does it mean for us to care for other people and have them be like family. You know, it was okay for Julie, my wife, to say that about me because we're married, right? I, I remember uh, Reed Crotty telling me a long time ago that uh, there was a wedding that he had done here and the pastor, it wasn't Reed, said to the couple, you know, in your marriage, the husband is gonna be the president 
and the wife is going to be the vice president. And Reed kind of, you know, audibly laughed, <laughs> and he thought, good luck. <laughs> That's not how it's going to be. <laughs> That's not how it's going to be, right? You know, when we're family, when we're family, there are ways in which we can be honest with each other if we're really pouring into this relationship, building trust, developing some kind of friendship that goes beyond simply just being around each other, but to really learn to rely on each other, to trust in one another. Not everybody that comes into our life ends up being the kind of person that will remain family. But when we have family like that, it makes all the difference, doesn't it? Jesus was born into a family, a family that was not yet ready to be a family, right? Mary and Joseph were betrothed. They were engaged. Jesus enters into this family and they become a family. Jesus had a mother, Mary. He had a father, Joseph. We end up finding out by assumption that Joseph may have passed away before Jesus reached adulthood because after Jesus was uh, baptized in the Jordan River, we don't really encounter Joseph, his father, any longer. But Mary shows up consistently. For instance, you may remember if you were here back in January, we talked about the wedding at Cana in Galilee, where Jesus and Mary attend this wedding with the disciples, and the family there runs out of wine. And Mary tells Jesus, do something about it. And he does. He turns ritual water into wine. Mary is there, but Joseph is not mentioned. Mary shows up again and again, and finally at the cross, we find that Mary is there watching what transpires upon Golgotha, the place of the skull, the hill where they crucified Jesus. But she's not alone. There are other people who are not family members that are there with her. They're there to support Jesus, to let him know he's not alone. But there are other people with Mary. Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and then this beloved disciple. They're all together. How many of them were there for Jesus and how many of them were there for Mary, right? So that she would not be alone. Joseph is not there, but Mary still has people around her as her family is being ripped apart on that Good Friday. Jesus, in speaking from the cross, this fourth word, invites Mary and the beloved disciple into a new family, and it gives us sort of an idea of what families should and could be like. The beloved disciple, most people assume, is John. John, the one who's writing this book, the Gospel of John. If you read on after Easter, you'll notice that Peter and the beloved disciple are the ones that run to the tomb when Mary tells them that Jesus is gone, that his body is not in the tomb. Peter is outrun by the beloved disciple, which may be a little bit of bragging if he is the author of that gospel. But he continually calls himself this. And some people have kind of wondered, is the beloved disciple, if it is John, identifying himself as the favorite? Or instead, is he essentially saying, I'm less important, Jesus is more important. I am the disciple that he loved, putting the emphasis on Jesus first. We don't really know the answer to this, but here is the disciple, the beloved disciple, the one disciple who showed up at the crucifixion, standing next to Mary. She is not alone at this difficult time. Jesus looks out and sees them, and he says to Mary, his mother, woman, here is your son. Pointing, in a sense, if he could point, to John, the beloved disciple. And then he says to his mother, uh, he says to John, 
this is your mother. In a sense, connecting them together. Now, what's interesting is, is that the text tells us that this disciple took Mary into his home from that point on. And there is evidence, historical evidence, that it's possible that John took care of Mary for the rest of his life and moved eventually to the city of Ephesus, where he and Mary stayed. And so not only did he take care of her then, but wherever he went from that point on. The beloved disciple and Mary become family. They were not kin. And yet, in a sense, Jesus connects them together. Her family is being ripped apart, and yet Jesus finds a way to connect her to someone so that she would not be on her own. Jesus loves to give us family. He loves to connect us to people in which we're supposed to trust and care for and be a part of. You know, when Jesus was out in the very beginning of his ministry, who did he turn to? He turned to fishermen and tax collectors and brought them on as disciples. And he created this sort of family of people. Now, I want you to remember that these are young men that probably had families, either uh, families that they were born into or families that they were supporting, and they gave all of that up. The very first act that Jesus does is destroy the families of the disciples. Now, he's inviting them into something more, but he rips away people from their fathers, right? And he takes them, but he makes a new family with these men, and they end up becoming very close to the point at which after Jesus' death, they become the very beginning of the church and find the courage through the Spirit to go out and start many new churches, create new families. Jesus took these people from very different families and created a new one. Jesus has a way of telling us that we're supposed to widen the circle of what a family is and looks like. When Jesus was uh, in a house teaching one day, It was so full that his own brothers and sisters and his mother couldn't get in. And they said, hey, your family is outside. They want to talk to you. They they can't get in. And he said, hey, you know, you you people right here in the house with me, you're my brothers, you're my sisters. He calls them his family, seemingly shunning his own family outside. Now, does does that mean that Jesus is anti-family? No. But it's interesting, he keeps redefining what a family is and connecting us to new people over and over and over again. When somebody asks him who our neighbors are, he says it's one of those horrible people, the Samaritans, right? That's the person that is acting like a neighbor. They should be part of our community. They are shunned from our community and that Jesus invites them in. Consistently, Jesus is remapping family, not saying that the nuclear family is bad, but saying it's not enough, that we need more. We need more people in our lives that are part of holding us together. Mary apparently has other children, brothers and sisters, and yet Jesus still connects her to John, the beloved disciple, to give her someone else to take care of her. Family expands in the church because Jesus tells us how we should treat one another and it's like they are family. Treat people like they're family. Now, Jesus doesn't expressly say that, but he says this, love one another just as I have loved you. Love one another just as I have loved you. Think about how nuclear families are supposed to operate. You're supposed to love one another through thick and thin, right? It's the family you're born into. It's the family that you're supposed to take care of. There are some people that would defend their own family members, but wouldn't lift a finger for a neighbor. We're supposed to defend these people. And what Jesus is saying to us is, the way you love Me, the way you love your family members, I want you to love other people like this. 
So when new people come into the church, we're supposed to treat them with the same kind of respect and love and to care for them in the same ways. Jesus calls us to love one another as he has loved us. Now that goes even deeper, even deeper than just how we treat our family members because Jesus has loved them with a sacrificial love, a sacrificial love. He has loved them in ways that are even deeper than family. And they're called to love one another just like that. I think about the sacrifices that my parents made for me all the time now as a parent and going through those moments of passing on information to my children, of learning to sacrifice for them and learning to not hold on so tightly to the car door when I'm in the passenger seat when my daughter is driving us around. The sacrifices my parents made. I remember when Julie and I were getting married, my mother uh, and, and stepfather reminded us that they knew that something was different about Julie instead of my other girlfriends when they saw the cell phone bill come in. Because apparently I was just calling her nonstop. And it was during that time when you had the peak hours and down out, remember? And I remember trying to wait until 7 p.m. to call her, but sometimes I would go ahead during those peak times. And so I would have to reimburse my family members Sacrificial love, sacrificial love. The way we treat one another, the way we care for one another. Jesus tells us that's the way we operate. And it's with that teaching that when John hears, here is your mother, he knows from that moment on, he's got to sacrifice to be in this new family with her. Many theologians talk about how the church really begins with the disciples and it continues with this moment that Jesus, in a sense, creates a church, a gathering of followers in this new family between Mary, his mother, and John, one of his disciples. A church is made up of, of people not born in the same family, but who were connected like family. I was telling our Sunday morning, uh, Sunday school class on Lent, that there are some churches that take this idea of a, being a family so far that they end up calling each other brother and sister, right? Brother Mike, Sister Pam, right? Brother Art. There was one guy whose name was brother and they called him brother, brother. They take it that far, but in a sense, even though it sounds kind of old timey, there's something beautiful about that, right? That we look at each other like family. You know, there are some people in our lives that have been there so long that they are like family automatically. People in Sunday school classes for a long time, they become trusted friends. But I wanna say probably the most beautiful example of this is when people are treated like family before they even feel like they completely belong. You know, I, I arrived here in 2013. I arrived here in 2013 with a daughter in elementary school and a son in the preschool. And my kids still remember that one of the first things they ever got from this church family was from Charlotte Word. Charlotte Word, at a women's event, gave them a little goldfish. It's probably one of those, you know, things you might get at the fair, supposed to only last a little while. For some reason, I don't know if it was because of Dora the Explorer or not, who speaks Spanish, they got the idea that they should call this goldfish rojo, which is red in Spanish. I don't know if they just didn't know the word gold in Spanish, or if that was the one, it didn't matter. And they loved that goldfish. And that was one of the first signs that they were part of a family here. When we treat each other like family before we're family, isn't that exactly what Jesus does to us? Isn't that exactly how Jesus treats us when he 
lays down his life for us even before we respond to him. He pours out his grace upon us even before we believe in him. When we treat people like family before they deserve it, when they, we treat people like family before they become like family, that is the highest expression of Christian love that we can have. Jesus says, love one another just as I have loved you. I want to share with you that treating each other like a family is a means of grace. Now, what, what is a means of grace? It's a very Methodist word or a Methodist phrase. Means of grace is an opportunity or a, or a, a, a skill or, a, or a, a, a practice that helps you grow in grace. It helps you connect with God more. Holy Communion, Bible study, prayer, all these are means of grace because by practicing them, we grow in love. Family, whether it be our nuclear family or whether it be the family that God gives us in church, going through that, learning to sacrifice, learning to care, learning to be there for one another is a means of grace because it is continually pushing the energies that we have away from ourselves and selfishness and into care of others. The more that we turn our hearts and our minds outward towards others, it's a means of grace because we're consistently figuring out how God is wired. Because is God wired selfishly? Is God wired to only take care of God's self? No, God is wired in whatever way God is wired to be outward focused all the time. God pours out love. He calls us into existence. God is always moving outward. The very best expression of that is how God came to be with us in his son, Jesus. Philippians chapter two tells us that Jesus did not take his divinity so seriously that he wouldn't come into this messed up world. No, out of love, he humbly became one of us and died a humiliating death for us because God is wired outward. When we learn to care for others and put the energy that we have in service of others and treating others like their family before their family, it's a means of grace because we are learning what it means to love other others, not because they loved us and we can finally do it for them. It's not a contractual relationship. It is not, uh, it's not based on the response of love, but it is based on how we can love like God loves. Jesus tells Mary, this is your son. He tells John, this is your mother. And he builds this new family, not based on blood, but based on friendship with Jesus. Imagine what it would be like, friends, to look out around a room in a sanctuary like this and see people where your strongest connection is through Jesus Christ and to know that because of that, you're bound into a relationship that will transcend all time. No matter where you go, no matter where you are, you're connected somehow to people like that. The church is more than just a place to belong, but it is a place to belong. And it's not just about belonging to each other and fitting in. If that were the case, some of us, including myself, may not always fit in, right? But because Christ is the glue that keeps us together. We all fit in no matter what. No matter what we've experienced, no matter where we have been, if Christ is our family connection, those are the ties that bind. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us, and I hope that you found this message to be meaningful and life-giving. I look forward to you joining us next time 
either on our live stream on Sunday mornings here at Bluff Park United Methodist Church. It's at 10 o'clock a.m. Or if you want to join us in person, you're welcome to do so. Also here at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. You can find out more about our church family, who we are, what we do, and how to get involved, as well as more information about our worship services at www.bluffparkumc.org. Hope you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you next time.